Greetings, students. Uh, welcome to the first session um, of your Education 2 Module 1. Um, and the name of the module is known as Aims and Conceptions of Education. It forms part of uh, the Western philosophy fragment of your Education 2 component, or rather course for this year. I am Mr. Mbuisa. Uh, you can call me Prof or Mr. or just Mr. Mbuisa. I'm happy to be having you in the first symposium for the year um, and wishing you all the best as we cover the different facets of this amazing scholarly work um, in Western philosophy. Um, I hope we have watched the introductory video in the orientation module um, that seeks to introduce us to how we are going to be doing things in the course um, and the implementation of the flipped pedagogy approach from the institution. So with, without wasting any time, um, let's get to the contents of this week. Now, the first symposium is, is entitled The Nature of Philosophy. An introduction to Western philosophy and philosophy of education. Now, it's very important for us to maybe think about the takeaway points um, that we want to sort of enact um, out of this session. And I just want us to look at that first in the session objectives. Now, by the end of the session, I expect you to at least know the following and to have um, thought about the following um, aspects. Now, the first thing is maybe looking at conceptually speaking, what is philosophy? Um, what does that mean? Um, so I want us to think about uh, a conceptual clarity into philosophy. So what is philosophy? What is not philosophy um, is also a question worth asking as part of the introductory fragment, because uh, we say we are studying philosophy in the first block. So we need to understand um, what we mean by the weight or concept philosophy. Um, then we're going to be looking at the origins of Western philosophy, since we, we're not just studying philosophy, but we're looking at Western philosophy. So um, I want us to look at the origins of Western philosophy, um, the different sub-disciplines, sub-components, sub-fragments um, that form part of um, the field or the, uh, the, the broader uh, body of knowledge known as philosophy. Um, and then I want us to do a quick recap um, at what politics and educations are, um, and this will sort of take us to a brief recap at what you covered in your first year in sociology, um, the previous block, and then we're also going to look at philosophy of education, um, what is it, and how is it connected to the broader uh, fragment really that we want to study. So our session has five segments, five takeaway points. Please do take note of them as we move along. But um, the most broader, uh, most important question for us, uh, for the sake of the session is, what is philosophy? What is philosophy? Um, maybe pause the video um, and take a few moments to think about uh, what is philosophy. So I want you to maybe get a notebook write down what you think philosophy is because um, uh, I might assume it's not your first time um, you are hearing of the word philosophy, right? So just uh, write down in everything you think uh, that comes to mind when you think of the word philosophy. So I will need you to refer back to your notes uh, a bit later in the session. Just pause the video and uh, write what philosophy is. Okay, um, looking at what philosophy is, uh, maybe it's important for us to think about what the word can mean, um, maybe bringing two paradigms to it. So if 
when I think of the word philosophy personally, um, two things come to mind. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is philosophy as a process. So for me, philosophy is a process um, and a sort of unique kind of process, but it's not just a, a, a process for me, but uh, I'll also say that philosophy is a product. Now, that brings a, a, a dialectic a description of what philosophy means for me. So I can say it's a process and it's a product. Now, what do I mean by it's a process? Uh, maybe let's think about what Socrates has uh, said. Now, Socrates said that I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. Now, this is a, a very powerful sentiment uh, from Socrates, who is one of the uh, greatest mm -hmm. thinkers of all time. Apologies for that. Uh, one of the greatest thinkers of all time, uh, who is known to be the father of uh, Western philosophy. Now, he is given this um, amazing title uh, because of his uh, immense contributions to the field. Now, remember, I said philosophy for me is a process and a product. Now, what does that mean? Um, so as a process, uh, I, I will say that philosophy is a process of thought, right? Um, it's, it's a process uh, that ignites one to tap into their being, um, tap into the inner depths of uh, their reasoning capabilities, um, and introspectively think about what they are exposed to uh, within that uh, particular moment. So each time you have to tap into the reasoning part of your mind, uh, I will say you are engaged in a process of philosophizing. So that's what philosophy uh, means, right? It, as a process. So it's a reasoning process um, of sorts. And as a product, um, we know that after you reason, um, something amazing is born. Um, and the product that is born uh, is what I will call knowledge. And we always say that knowledge is wisdom. So for me, when I say philosophy is a process um, and a product, I simply mean that uh, philosophy, uh, describing what the word means, uh, is just a process um, of reasoning that gives birth to knowledge or wisdom because knowledge is wisdom, right? So that's that's what philosophy means. So maybe reflect on what you've written um, and think about does it correlate to what um, I've sort of described in this particular slide. So think about that. Now let's get a bit more conceptual, right? And look at what philosophy is etymologically speaking, right? Now, what is etymology? It's a philosophical study of words. Um, so in etymology, we are studying the different components that make up words. For example, if we look at the word philosophy, since we're still looking at what is philosophy, uh, we see that uh, etym etymologically speaking, the word philosophy is made by two words, and it is the word in red known as philo, and the other word in yellow uh, called sophie or sophia. So philosophia. So um, looking at what the words stand for, philo means love, and sophie means wisdom. So philo is a type of love um, known as philia. Um, which is a strong, attractive desire for a particular object or phenomenon. Now, what phenomenon um, does philosophy uh, lie under? 
the phenomenon, it's the phenomenon known as Sophia or the phenomenon of wisdom. So what does that mean? Uh, Sophia simply means the genuine applications of knowledge. So that's what wisdom is categorized by having insight and a deeper understanding of certain things. So that's wisdom. So having insight and deeper understandings connotes to your reasoning capabilities. So hence I said, when I think of the word philosophy, I think of a process, um, which is the process of showing this strong desire um, uh, for wisdom or knowledge in that sense. So that's, that's what philosophy means. Um, but le let's look at some scholarly descriptions of it. So looking at what Stedish um, 2014 described, um, still looking at what is philosophy and what philosophers are interested in, um, we see that uh, Stedish says that philosophers are basically in interested in uh, basic ideas or concepts uh, that may be inclusive of knowledge knowledge, understanding truth, goodness, um, and how they relate to each other. So philosophers are keenly interested in um, the power of knowledge, uh, the power of ideology or ideas um, in relation or in correlation to each other uh, for the construction of meaning, right, uh, about different fragments of uh, society. But what's important to understand is maybe looking at what philosophy or what philosophers uh, do not put their interest in. So the first thing is that philosophy uh, does not involve doing experiments or collecting data empirical. So philosophy is not like science where we care about uh, research going uh, door to door or on the ground, experimenting and all of that. So it also doesn't involve um, exploring how we think and the assumptions lying behind our thinking and becoming clear about the concepts we use. So it's, it's, it's not really linked towards the linguistic side of things uh, or uh, really the the, the tangible side of things, uh, but rather it looks at concrete stuff. So it's concerned with the nature of knowledge, so the concreteness of things. Um, so it looks at the grounds for knowledge claims, the reasoning behind uh, what we assume uh, in knowledge frameworks. Uh, it's, it's also concerned with um, reasoning or justifications of our thoughts and opinions. Um, and it it's mostly important, uh, uh, um, what's this? It, laying towards an understanding of um, what value, questions of value um, we can sort of look into. Um, so the purpose of philosophy really um, is concerned with bringing clarity to thought, so the reasoning uh, behind thought, uh, so that concepts are carefully analyzed and arguments uh, that are robust are created as a result. So. That's that's what philosophers um, care about. So it's leaning towards the side of what uh, thought, rhetoric, um, and reasoning um, sort of bring out um, into the world, really, for understanding of uh, different fragments of the world, right? So that's that's what philosophy is, um, simply put. And we call all of this understanding wisdom, and hence philosophy means um, the love of wisdom in that sense, right? But where does philosophy originate? Maybe let's let's think about that. Um, there must have been a point in time where, where philosophy didn't exist. So let's let's see where. It, it was born and uh, it's it's sort of uh, arose, right? Um, Western philosophy um, has its foundations uh, in Greece, right? And this is because of a shift really in um, 
the nature of things in society at the time. Um, so before philosophy, uh, reasoning, wisdom uh, dominated, um, we had what we called um, the, the resonance era. And the point of the resonance era, uh, it was really to sort of justify uh, the existence of the universe uh, using bounds of uh, religion, right? So that's where philosophy sort of comes from. So it, it goes back in time in the Middle Ages where people used to believe in the existence of a God and the existence of a God will justify um, how things were done, the, the, the kingship system, rulership systems that govern the world at the time. And uh, what we notice is that because the Middle Ages or the, the age of, um, in a way, religious thought uh, gave birth to uh, subjugation of certain members of society and oppression or the misuse of power or the use of religion to justify um, uh, oppressive governance systems uh, we had the age of enlightenment coming through where people were saying, um, you know what, because these people are using the existence of a being that we cannot even see, being a god, um, how can we maybe justify our existence outside the bounds of, the, of a god? So how about we move outside the bounds of um, metaphysical reasoning? Uh, to looking at tangible reality. And uh, that's how philosophy was born. So it, it was born uh, at a time where the empires were being distraught, distorted and uh, where city-states uh, were beginning to um, remove themselves or unentangle themselves from um, empires um, to avoid uh, rulership uh, under the divine command uh, or religious or metaphysical uh, knowledge. So that's the age we call um, the age of enlightenment. Now, that's where Western philosophy sort of originates. Now, what is this age of enlightenment? Um, uh, this is a time where the French and Greeks uh, started asking themselves, uh, burning questions uh, that seek to move them, their reasoning outside the bounds of religion. So they started questioning the origin of the universe um, outside the Adam and Eve story and the seven days um, uh, uh, parable that God created heaven and earth in, in six days and rested on the seventh. So it, it, it was designed to sort of discard religious mythology and uh, work with now logic and reasoning. So that's where uh, philosophy got to be born. And at that time, um, certain scholars emerged, um, certain thinkers emerged, um, and, and I have them, a few of them, um, on the slides in the 1740s, uh, we have people like John Loki, we, who we're going to explore later in the course, um, Rousseau, um, who you guys will meet um, if you do history um, in your, you've met rather if you did history one uh, in your social sciences one module. Um, we have people like Immanuel Kant, who you will meet um, some of uh, his works um, as you complete your degree. Uh, we have people like Georges uh, Barton um, and Dennis um, as one of the major scholars uh, at the time. So the map below shows uh, certain affected uh, countries that uh, undertook this rise in um, the age of enlightenment. Uh, but uh, it's important to understand who was involved at the time, because we say um, the birth of philosophy uh, can be, of Western philosophy rather, can be traced back to um, Greece, right? So we have the people we call the sophists. Um, now, sophists were Greeks 
uh, who undertook this ideology of uh, uh, using a radical uh, or logic, uh, radical reasoning or logic uh, to justify uh, reality and a human existence. So since uh, the path of philosophy, uh, we started having the Greeks uh, taking this uh, spirit of intellectual aberration, um, and they started uh, sort of training themselves uh, using this philosophy, um, and people became uh, teachers of various fields, and um, a lot of self-improvement was uh, noticed at that time uh, amongst the Sophies. Uh, so more and more people became educated in that sense. And uh, in a way, they became independent of the imperial system that existed at the time. Um, and we also see that um, these ideologies, uh, philosophical ideologies, uh, became very popular um, and were very concentrated in the Athens, right? Um, if you if you check, a lot of uh, great thinkers uh, originated from there at the time. Now, what they studied uh, when they were at school um, is what we will call um, rhetoric, right? So they were involved in rhetoric, um, and the rhetoric became uh, the norm of the day. Uh, so. In modern terms, we can say rhetoric is a form of curriculum uh, that was used at the time, um, and it sort of uh, turned ordinary people to uh, the most radical um, and intellectually uh, sound individuals. So um, if you check what is mentioned here on the slides to say that um, for example, the, 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 the sophists who were the educators at the time um, taught rhetoric, which is the form of curriculum that was born um, at that time when philosophy came about. And um, this, these sophists uh, promised to make uh, humble men, lowest people, uh, remember the clergy religious leaders were the most uh, were considered to be the most educated at the time, but uh, the rhetoric curriculum uh, could turn these humble, ordinary people uh, to be able to speak in big assemblies, law courts, and um, they could win big arguments and uh, could uh, therefore make financial means for themselves and um, have an astounding public life. If they knew this uh, curriculum called uh, rhetoric or this knowledge uh, or this system of thinking, um, and they also the sophists also offered to teach people how to meet, to win arg arguments uh, regardless of which side they take. So uh, right and wrong became an objective phenomenon, um, or rather objectively subjective, uh, to say whether you take the opposing side. Uh, or the foresight uh, you, of any argument, you will win either ways uh, because of the rhetoric. Um, and so the, the major argument at the time was to say that uh, no truth is universally valid. So good and evil, truth and false were matters of individual judgment. So there were no universal um, standards. So that's what rhetoric uh, gave birth to. And uh, all of this happened in uh, what we will call um, the School of Athens, right? So the School of Athens is what is depicted on this um, slide. Uh, we have the greatest thinkers, greatest mathematicians. So this is the, the, the painting of uh, the famous School of Athens. We have uh, Socrates and Aristotle, uh, Plato and uh, the others. Uh, yeah, having uh, formed part of uh, the School of Athens, right? So, yeah, this is an iconic painting that shows some of the greatest thinkers um, that we've uh, had uh, in time. Please go through and look at, uh, search on Google and look at an annotated uh, diagram of uh, this picture. 
uh, it may actually pop up as one of your assessments later on. Right now, still on the SOFIS though. Um, so SOFIS also attacked uh, religious uh, and moral values of uh, the Antenian society at the time. Um, some of them argued that religion was useless and others uh, said that uh, religion was as a result of human invention so it cannot uh, be acceptable a form of a reasoning society um, and others even argue that law did not come from gods as the imperialist system uh, connoted and um, also argued that there was uh, the laws that existed at the time uh, uh, were, were not based on objective or universal standards of justice and good, so they they can be questioned. So they argue that law was something made by powerful citizens for their own benefit, and they sort of bend it to benefit certain members of society uh, while excluding certain fragment uh, a certain fragment of members of society. So that's uh, the argument that was made as well. Now. Of course, uh, these arguments do not come without uh, implications. Uh, so the dangerous implication of this is that um, is to say that law did not need to be obeyed since it rested on higher principle than uh, some people might have thought. Um, and the the major argument is to is to say that. Um, the implications that it led to a disruptive community life because it stressed the selfish uh, interests of the individual over the general welfare of the city. So when uh, these teachings started being spread, um, it sort of uh, was an attack to the social order of the time um, um, as new forms of thinking were being introduced and new interpretations as a result. So a lot of people started rebelling uh, against uh, the systems that were put in place at the time. So uh, we we also note that some sophists attacked Athenian emphasis on moderation, self discipline. So um, in that sense, they argued that people should maximize pleasure and destroy traditions that restricted them. So to say that people must live a life. Uh, that is uh, free, so they, they they are objectively liable, subjectively liable to their actions. Um, so that, those are some of the arguments that they made at that time, uh, which became very problematic. So uh, in as much as the rise in philosophy, um, historically speaking, led to a lot of radical, amazing uh, liberal ideologies, uh, that governs society, but it also led to a lot of uh, problematic uh, connotations associated with uh, that, uh, which uh, leads us to uh, a famous person uh, who was involved really in addressing that. So we look at um, Socrates. Now, who is Socrates? Um, Socrates uh, employed an intellectual methodology that Sophies had created to address questions. So she, he employed the rhetoric system. Um, uh, and, but he did it in a very different uh, manner, really. So historically speaking, where does this person come from? Uh, he lived between 469-399 BC. Uh, was born in a middle-class family and began adult life as a stone mason uh, soon gave gave this up uh, to devote his life in philosophy uh, where he was uh, really looking at um, the nature of human existence which is what we call um, state uh, what is ethics um, uh, specifically virtue ethics so he looked into uh, the right way to conduct oneself in life. So this was uh, inspired by the nature of life at the time um, as a result of these sophist um, ideologies and the disruption society. So um, the argument that he made was to say that uh, sophists had taught skills but had no insight into the questions that really mattered. So they didn't answer questions such as according to him, 
uh, what's the purpose of life? What are the values by which man should live? Uh, how does man perfect his character? And uh, he felt that Sophies had attacked the old system of belief, but had not uh, really given a con constructive replacement of the system. So this is where a um, majority of his work uh, stems from. Um, and if we look at what was his really central concern, uh, with Socrates, um, the central uh, idea or point of reference uh, was the perfection of individual human character. So he believed in three things, really. The first one is that he believed in moral values, uh, to say that they are attained when the individual um, regulated their life according to the objective standards, um, that they arrive into after doing Dara um, rational uh, introspection and reflection. Um, so he believe, also believe that individuals uh, will be able to have certain values necessary to live a good and just life when um, reasoning uh, came into the picture um, and it, it was used as uh, a sense of uh, reference for guiding oneself and uh, also formatively ruling over one's uh, agency, right? So he also believed in that. So the first thing he believed in was to say, uh, through rational reflections, one gets to have uh, moral values that regulate the individual. Secondly, he believed that um, if um, want to have a virtuous life, uh, a value-driven life, then uh, one needs to, uh, yeah, one needs to uh, be able to introspectively rule over one's uh, soul, one of one's uh, sense of agency uh, through the use of rational reasoning, of course. Um, he also believed that uh, true education meant uh, the shaping of character um, according to values uh, discovered through the active and critical use of reason. So central idea uh, behind Socrates' work was to say reasoning, introspecting, um, and uh, using uh, values to guide over one's a sense of agency was central to um, a life of virtue and uh, constructing a society that uh, is value driven, right? Um, so we see that he emphasizes on the power of reasoning um, in, in his thought. Um, so exploring those ideas even further, uh, then we then need to think about the power of reasoning according to Socrates, right? Um, so Socrates uh, firstly wanted to subject all human beliefs and behaviors to clear light of reason. And uh, so this was designed to remove uh, the pre-existing uh, subjugative systems uh, of authority, uh, tradition, dogma, superstition, and myth. Um, we also believe that uh, for us to do that, reasoning uh, was the only the proper guide to the most critical problem of human existence. So the question of good and evil. So we can only judge what is good and bad. So basically, uh, for us to establish ethics, uh, we we need to use reasoning. So that's uh, the power of reasoning, according to him. Um, and he taught that rational inquiry was uh, very important um, in order for one to test their opinions, weigh the merit of one's ideas, alter beliefs on the basis of knowledge and rationality. Um, he also believed that people uh, should uh, be engaged in critical self-examination um, in order to perfect their characters. Um, and he believed that um, opinions and traditions uh, can be formed based on um, uh, clear conducts uh, or convictions uh, that uh, one can 
rationally defend, right? So is thinking about that. Uh, Thinking so about that uh, silence. Um, so thinking about the power of reasoning. Apology. Okay. Um, apologies for those pauses. Um, so thinking about the power of reasoning um, ex exposes us to maybe a practical. Uh, example that is shown here. So we see that reasoning firstly is um, important at creating or rather at changing stigmas or society's uh, traditional conceptions of how uh, things should be in the world. So that's that's one fragment of it. So that's the power of reasoning. Um, and it's, it's important building character uh, and a sense of virtue um, good principles or reshaping the ethics of uh, society. Um, so that's one other ideology uh, behind that, according to uh, Socrates, uh, which is, um, I think, the two are sort of important in understanding um, the cartoon that is uh, presented in this uh, slide, right? So if you look at the cartoon here, it shows us how the power of reason um, sort of influences how uh, one perceives things, perceives different situations uh, or realities in society. So the first uh, uh, cartoon bubble uh, here, we have um, a man and a young, a young boy uh, over there. So the boy says, ouch, you're standing on my neck. Um, and the person says, well, that's one point of view, but one could also say that you are trying to treat me with your neck. And um, the person continues to say in the next um, um in the next uh, cartoon babble, uh, he says, you see in the post-modern condition, we create our own reality based upon our internalized preconceptions. Since there is no longer one objective truth, we are free to create our own truth. So you see there is no right and wrong, just an infinite number of equally valid stories. And the boy continues to say, but you're still standing on my neck. And the man over there says, you never went to college, did you? So <laughs> it's quite a funny one, uh, but uh, it helps sums up a uh, majority of uh, arguments that Socrates made uh, regarding the power of reasoning um, in that regard, right? So... Looking at uh, the next slide, so uh, before we think about what's on the next slide, um, I, I want us to, for, for the sake of the seminar, I want you to uh, write down your reflections on this cartoon. What do you think about uh, the man's use of reasoning? Uh, do you agree with him? Uh, do you think uh, he is justified uh, in, in him viewing things in this way? Or do you think uh, whatever he's doing is still wrong? Um, so 
do write down your reflections on that um, and uh, do share them with your peers when you get to um, the seminar for this week, right? So going back to um, some of the thoughts here, I want us to think about an important contribution that um, Socrates made, and that's something we call the Socratic method. Right? So the Socratic method is based on different uh, ideas or beliefs that from Socrates. So the first one is that Socrates believed that knowledge was innate in the human mind. So it was intrinsically, knowledge is intrinsically found within the human mind. And uh, his argument is to say that in order for one to extract this knowledge uh, into the conscious uh, one will have to use a question and answer method, which is known as the Socratic method. Um, and this method, uh, for it to be applicable, um, Socrates um, attracted a loyal audience of young men, uh, mostly from very well-off families, and he encouraged them to debate on the most fundamental concepts of human behavior um, in order for, for them to define the guidelines of ethical conduct. Now, what we get is that uh, the, the debates that he incepted will begin uh, with students uh, searching questions into traditional assumptions that um, everyone took for granted, and then they then progressed to show that those assumptions were rooted in customs and prejudices that existed at the time, and then they were rooted in logic, right? And this will then lead the students to having more questions uh, about these customs um, in order to yeah, develop precise definitions uh, in, into a category of concepts such as um, whether those belief systems were uh, of piety, were of justice, were they good or evil. So um, in, in that regard, in this uh, line of this, Socrates did not uh, develop set rules of how the engagement should go. Uh, rather, he let uh, the, the students be. Um, as he believed that by giving uh, his followers, his young men, rigorous questioning and logical uh, thinking process skills, uh, he, will, he was creating a mentality that could perceive correct conduct under all conditions by just uh, the use of uh, sub, what's this objective reasoning in that regard. So what we're getting summatively really is to say that um, Western philosophy um, combatly um, was founded in uh, Greece and it originated with sophists uh, who were uh, some of the first few people who uh, characterize themselves into different careers as educators and other fragments. And uh, the problem is that even though this line of thinking liberated people from uh, the clutches of the imperial system of the time, uh, that where religion was used as grounds to uh, subjugate other people, uh, it uh, sort of excluded uh, the most important uh, fragment, which is uh, finding a replacement to the messed up system. So the advocacy was liberation, and uh, we see that Socrates comes later on uh, to say, even though uh, you, are, you are using philosophy to liberate yourselves, I am not against that. Um, and they're using it to gain socioeconomic prominence. And I'm not against that. However, um, we should also think about what will replace the traditions and uh, thinking systems of society 
uh, after we remove uh, religious reasoning. So it's not enough to just remove and eradicate all forms of traditional knowledge, but it's also important to um, find a replacement system in that regard so as to create continuity uh, in society and maintain social order. So that's, that's how he, he emerged uh, as he created the Socratic method, uh, which was a system that um, sort of created that sense of balance in the use of philosophy, um, in, the, in, in the applications of a rhetoric for people to still maintain um, their rational reasoning um, and objectivity in a way that exemplifies character in the interaction. So that's that's really what we get from um, Socrates' uh, contributions to this amazing field of work. Uh, but um, I want us to then move at the second or rather the third segment of the session, which is uh, thinking about the different branches uh, of philosophy that arose as a result. Right. So these are the different sub-disciplines in philosophy. The first one um, is known as metaphysics. A metaphysics seeks to study what is real, um, what exists um, in that sense. Um, aesthetics concerns itself with uh, the study of beauty, um, and it became a very major fragment of um, what characterized knowledge at some point in the world, uh, with arts forming part of that. Uh, we also have epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. We have ethics, which is the study of how we ought to live, so right and wrong, good and bad. Uh, we also have logic, the study of argument analysis. Uh, but what we are concerned about is the study of knowledge, epistemology. And uh, we care about um, how, how uh, knowledge came to be, um, and how the concept of education and its aims are exemplified really um, in our society. So uh, even though broadly, um, as we have seen in the first and sec second segment of this session, philosophy was designed as a liberative tool uh, for members of society, uh, but uh, the central uh, argument is that uh, philosophy um, at the heart of philosophy is knowledge, which is wisdom. And um, as, as, as we are studying Western philosophy and uh, applying it to education, we care about um, how knowledge uh, submerges itself um, into our understanding of the world um, and the interactions that exist within it. Uh, which takes us to the second, it's, it's rather to the next segment of the session, which is looking at politics and education. Um, with a quick recap at what we covered in um, your education on course. So, if you may remember, in the first year course, uh, Sociology of Education, which I instructed, um, we identified that society. Uh, is made up of five social institutions. And we had a, a sociological paradigm or theory um, that said that these five institutions um, that form society uh, can be correlated into an organ system of interrelated parts. So in, in that sense, uh, questions that arise then are, if we look at this organ system and uh, taking it to the role of education, because uh, we know that, I mean, philosophy was born from social systems and social situations at uh, that particular time, um, which gave rise to this amazing field of thought and knowledge. Um, 
we we does ask uh, what is the role of schools in society because they were born as a result of the birth of philosophy so what's the role of schools in society um and another question you may ask is that maybe uh, before even looking at the role of schools, uh, who controls these schools? Um, uh, so who controls education? And we also look at possible relations between politics and education. Because uh, if you look at the role of schools in society, the reasoning behind this may be connoted to um, the value of education. Um, and the sharing of wisdom and knowledge in that regard. But if we take it a step further on the control of education, then it may bring some governance uh, reasoning behind it, um, the politics institution. So maybe a question that arises then is, what is the connection between politics and education? So those are things we can think about. Now, responding to the questions um, raised above uh, requires us to understand uh, the relationship between education and politics. So if you look at the mini diagram here shown, uh, we see that uh, politics filters into education, education filters into uh, politics. Um, you remember we studied in sociology as well that uh, that uh, Education uh, is important for society in that it leads to the allocations of roles in society. But we also know that uh, for the jurisdiction and uh, management of what happens in schools um, or what happens in the education institution, uh, politics are involved in that regard. So we see that um, in one fragment, uh, politics and education have um, what we can call a symbiotic relationship, right? And uh, but we also note that the relationship between education and politics can also be argued to be very parasitic in nature. So what that means is that um, in the symbiosis, um, education leads to benefits in politics and politics lead to benefits in education. But in the parasitic relation, uh, it means only one institution benefits. And we see that majority of the time now is that uh, the politics are the ones that tend to benefit more than the education institution. So the relationship uh, can also be tend to be very parasitic in, um, in that regard. Right. So still on maybe looking at the symbiotic nature. So we, we know that uh, education and politics, uh, as I've mentioned, enjoy a, a symbiotic relationship. So because they influence each other, uh, but we, we see that education or the lack of uh, thereof influences the collective intellect, goals, values, and body of politics. So at goes on in schools, influences what how the politics sort of unfold, because the intellectual uh, goal-oriented and value-based work that happens in education institutions uh, lead to narratives driven in the politics. Um, so in that regard, we can say that the way in which a society is educated will thus determine who is able to hold power or office in the politics institution, and how those in power elected or chosen. So the systems that go into that come from the education institution, uh, how much power and control those in office will have at their disposal uh, is also acute upon by intellects. Um, and what laws are considered reasonable and unreasonable and how those representing the state will choose to regulate, promote and establish educational institution. So we see that, um, the centerpiece in the symbiosis nature of uh, politics and education, there exists that relation. And it's important to always remember as we go into aims and conceptions of education, because we ask the question, who controls education? 
And it's important to think about the relations between politics and education uh, when we think about that fragment of things. But also looking at the toxic, parasitic, oppressive nature of the two, uh, we, we see that um, even though the last point is critical as it shows the cycle uh, becoming a full cycle between education and uh, politics, uh, we, we note that uh, just as much as education institutions have a role in creating, maintaining, and limiting the state, but the, the political uh, fragment has immense power over the edu educational fragment. So we can think about how modern states uh, have control over how much schools are funded, what they can and can't teach. So we can think of fragments such as they detect whether we study uh, religious knowledge or evolution, sexual education or the restriction thereof, uh, the way in which history is framed, um, um, among other things, really, or the glorification of white supremacy or the glorification of a black subjugation or vice versa. So we see the, the power uh, that politics may have on over education and the oppressive nature. So um, in that sense, we, we've even noted that um, some states strictly pro prohibit uh, secular education as it is in their interest to keep their population misinformed. So some members of uh, political fragments restrict their society from learning anything whatsoever. And this is precisely because the more informed or educated their population becomes, the more likely it is their stronghold on power will be overthrown. So to safeguard the power they hold uh, to have these oppressive systems, um, education is weaponized in that regard, um, which is then important to look into uh, the depths of education. So, so, and the depths of knowledge in that sense to say um, it's not enough to know philosophy or to love this wisdom or to correlate ourselves with this wisdom. Uh, but it, it's, it's important to also understand um, the complexities that exist within uh, this framework of wisdom, which takes us to the next segment of the session, which uh, looks at philosophy of education. Now, what is philosophy of education? Um, now, looking at uh, this descriptively, uh, we define philosophy of education um, as a branch of philosophy that addresses philosophical questions uh, concerning um, the nature, aims, and problems of education. So this is concerned with um, power dynamics that exist, politics in relation to education. So again, uh, we question the, the nature of education, uh, the value um, paradox that exists with looking at education. So we also say that this branch um, of philosophy examines the goals and forms methods and meaning of education, right? Um, and we also say philosophy of education is a branch of applied or practical philosophy. So it brings this wisdom to life, a uh, concern with the nature um, or end, most important, the aims of education. So what is education for? And the philosophical problems arising from educational theory and practices. Who who controls problems such as who controls education and uh, what gives them rights to control education? Um, what is their priority as they control it? So we examine such um, uh, problems that exist in education. And we use different forms of philosophical inquiry um, in education uh, for us to achieve this. So we use conceptual inquiry uh, which uh, seeks to find our understanding of um, the use of words, concepts within the field of um, education. Um, so we understand what it means, what is it in its nature. We also look at the descriptive empirical nature of uh, 
education. So we do descriptive empirical inquiry where we question um, their how. So how is education used um, in that sense? Right. So the conceptual is the what, what is it? Uh, descriptive is the how, how is it uh, used? How is it descriptively um, uh, deemed to be? Um, and we also have analytical inquiry. So with the analytical, we look at um, pros and cons really, uh, to the extent at which uh, the, 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 the what education is supposed to do is achieved um, in that sense. Um, so we, we try and think about uh, the, the who really, an analysis of who controls education, um, what uh, framework do they use to control it, um, and uh, the sense of power dynamics that exist within the fraternity of education. Um, we also think about the normative inquiry, which looks at the, the, the why. Um, so in this fragment, we look at uh, the how. So the why and the how and possible uh, applicabilities and adaptations that need to be made um, in our inquiry into an understanding of education, right? So looking at philosophy of education um, and the course itself, aims and conceptions of education, um, we ask the burning question, what role, what is the role of school in society? So what is school for? Which is uh, a question that a lot of us have asked ourselves. Uh, going up at some point. So we ask, what is education for? Uh, what is school for? Uh, and is education and school the same thing? So in that sense, we look at the uses of education as it takes place within a school. Uh, when we lo look at education as a process, um, which takes us to what harm 1989 makes reference to as the uses of the concept education. So it says um, education, uh, or rather the role of school in society in a philosophical sense can be deemed to be uh, firstly for uh, the sociological use, so societal benefit. Uh, secondly, the institutional use, which is uh, for the sake of institutions of society uh, and general enlightenment use. Um, and it's important to think about uh, the, the, the different shapes uh, and sizes of these shapes in the use of education. So firstly, the sociological use, institutional use, general enlightenment use. So those are the three uses of education, education one, education two, and education three, um, according to Ham. And um, what you may ask yourself then is, which, if you deem education to be a process and a product, or a product, um, when you look at the sociological use, does it exemplify um, education more as a product or more as a process. Um, so where does the value lie? Um, in the institutional use, where does the value uh, lie as well? Uh, is it in education being a product uh, for institutions or a process that happens in these institutions? And in the general enlightenment use, also where the priorities lie, is it in the process or the product or both? if that's even an, an option. So those are different conceptions that um, I want you to think about uh, as you go and uh, engage with this week's readings and as you go and uh, prepare for your symposiums, so for your seminars with your instructors in that uh, regard for this week. Um, this is a list of uh, references that were used uh, in preparation for 
today's session. Uh, please do uh, check these out. Uh, some of the readings are prescribed as part of uh, this week's reading work. Uh, please do check it out at your own uh, time. This marks the end of this week's uh, symposium. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, please do engage with the prescribed readings for this week. And after doing the prescribed readings, please do look at your prescribed seminar questions. Uh, do go to class on time. Uh, your fellows, your academic fellows will be waiting for you in the designated venues um, as per the announcement or the arrangements for the week. Uh, looking forward to uh, hearing the amazing feedback from your fellows on how the sessions were carried out uh, for this week. Uh, please do send me, a, drop an email to me uh, if you have any content related questions, if you have fragments of the session that you did not understand and you'd, you'd like to have more clarity on, um, I'll be happy to respond to um, any of your inquiries um, and do read all your prescribed readings and uh, also do check out your recommended readings. So uh, let's just take note of the distinction. Prescribed readings are compulsory to do uh, and your recommended readings are the ones that you can check out uh, to support responding to your seminar questions and uh, they also support a rigorous understanding of or in-depth understanding of uh, the symposium uh, the prescribed seminar questions all the best uh, with the rest of the week um, looking forward to the next symposium. Thank you very much. Take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.